we are going to begin this series of lessons on righteousness. I believe this is a very critical study of the Bible because one of the key doctrines of the Bible is righteousness. And another key doctrine is godliness. And both of those doctrines need a thorough study and understanding by all children of God. We're on our eighth lesson. We're looking tonight at judgments made by the church. Now, of course, what we have is we have passages that tell us not to judge. Judge not, be not judge, Matthew 7 1. But then we go to the book of John, and John, Jesus said, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So that's a commandment in the original. So we are commanded to judge, and we're not commanded to judge. So there's some kind of judgment we're not commanded to do, and there's some kind of judgment we are commanded to do. This is a quick summary of our prior seven lessons. And when we study it carefully, the judgment we are to do is according to God's word, and we'll lay it out in understandable terms. When brethren have problems in the church, and we do, I mean, we're people. We all have flaws of some sort. So when we have problems, just like in the Old Testament, the Lord has designated a method of solving problems between members of the church. And we want to look at this in Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. These instructions relate to matters where there were personal problems, sins against the person. Now, when we put together all of the passages of the New Testament that relate to the discipline of members, we see that there are passages that relate to something that is public and widely known, and then there are passages that relate to private matters. This relates to a private matter. So we'll lay it out, and we'll deal with passages later that deal with public matters. And the method of dealing with them still goes back to the principles of the Old Testament. In principle, the law of Moses had a righteous system of dealing with difficulties, so we always have problems between people. That's between a husband and wife, or brother and sister, father and mother, or children and their parents, or grandparents, or just dealing with people in general. Or dealing with some of God's people, dealing with other God's people. That's what we're dealing with right here. And if thy brother sinned against thee. Now, here in this instance, the brother has sinned against me. All right? He says, go, what are you going to do? Tell everybody all about his sin. That's not what it says. Go, show him his fault between thee and him alone. In other words, you don't spread it around. You go to that person privately. You go to him alone. And you show him his fault. Now, in dealing with how we determine fault, it's right here. If we don't have scripture for it and can establish it by scripture, we have not established the brother has committed a fault or a sin. Now, a brother may have committed a fault or sin, and we can't establish it because we don't know the scriptures well enough. In that case, we need to study more and then go back and study what the brother wants to study it out. That's clear. So right here now, we show him his fault. Between thee and him alone, you don't spread it around. You don't talk about it. If he hears thee, if he listens to you. Now, the word hear can be used in more than one way. It could be used in the sense that I heard a, there was a sound on my eardrum. But it also is used in the sense of hearing with understanding. Now, in other words, if I know of something is sinful that my brother has done, and I show it to him, but I don't show it clearly enough to establish proof that it is. I just say, oh, brother so-and-so teaches that that's sinful. But that doesn't establish anything. I need to show by the scriptures that it's sinful. Now, if brother so-and-so that I cited has a good argument, I can cite his argument, his reasoning for it. But I must always go to scripture to establish my case. If I don't give scripture for it, I don't have any business even going to the brother. Because my job is to show him his fault. 
Why? I want him to repent and be right with God again. If that's not my reason for going, there's something wrong with me. I need to do some repentance. So we should all be about the salvation of the souls of people. If we're not about that, we need some attitude adjustment ourselves. So go back now if our brother sin against me. See, if he does sin against me, go, go in his fault. Don't spread it around between me and him alone. If he hears me, you have gained your brother. That has gained thy brother. What was the purpose of going to him? If you loved him, it was to gain him back. To get him retrieve him out of his sin, out of his sinful condition. And if that wasn't my purpose, there's something wrong with me, and I need some repentance. So my purpose was the brother. Maybe he upset me. Maybe he hurt me. That doesn't matter. He hurt me. He offended. He made he made me upset. He did something that was hurtful to me. Still, I need to try to retrieve him. And if I'm not going to him to gain him. If I'm going to him just to crush him, to push him down, then there's something wrong with me. And again, I need to repent. So we're not going to spend more time on that. I think that's pretty evident from our knowledge of the scriptures. But, notice but, if he fail to hear thee, if he hear thee not, then what? Take with thee one or two more. Why? What are they going to do? Well, Remember the principle in the law of Moses, two or three witnesses. That at the mouth of two witnesses or three, every word may be established. You need evidence of it. Now, I want you to notice here with this. If he fail to hear thee, take the witness. Now, the second time you go, who is to try to show him his fault? Most people, and I'm most, even preachers, preachers don't read this passage carefully. I run into preachers that don't read this carefully. It doesn't say, and I'll put myself in this, I'm the brother that's been sent again. I go to John Doe over here the first time. I show him his fault between me and him alone. He won't hear me, then I take two or three witnesses. Two or, two or, two or three more, one or two more, that at the mouth of two witnesses or three, every word may be established. Now, Next verse is going to tell us who actually exhorts him in the second time we go. And it's not the first person. It wouldn't be me if I was the one that sent him. It is the witness. Those witnesses, therefore, are going to have to go back through everything we just laid out. They're going to have to know that he sinned, know that he committed the act, and they're going to have to know that he not only committed it, but that what he did was sinful. Now, what if we only have one witness? What if I'm the only one that says that John Doe did this against me? We need two or three witnesses. And the principle of two or three witnesses is clear in throughout the Bible. I might have something against John Doe. I might be in to get it. How to get it? That's possible. It's possible that I may have had something may have been something that happened that I may have just misinterpreted what was said. That's possible or done. I saw this, I was reading a, a bulletin, it had a bulletin about this fellow, this woman, uh, she was just into everybody, everybody's business, member of the church. It's a bulletin article, it's a made up story. And she said, uh, I saw your car parked right next to the, to the beer joint. Right? And so I'm going to tell everybody about you drinking. Well, that could have happened to me one time because I was, I had car trouble north of Mount View, Oklahoma, and there's a beer joint out there in, out in the country, and there's not a house for two miles around. It was hot. I walked in the beer joint and used their phone to call somebody to walk back to my car. Okay. But someone could easily have seen me coming out of that pier joint. Nobody would go by where I came out or what I was going in. But it could have happened. And you see? And so the, the story goes in this book. I think it was the Putnam City Bulletin. I got. But anyhow, in that Bulletin article, it said, he said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to go over and park my car right next to your house tonight and leave it to the lady. 
you have to think about that. So his car was parked in front of our house all night. Okay. So, but anyhow, I thought that was kind of funny. So, if thy brother sin against thee, go show him the fault between thee and him on honest ass gain thy brother if he hears thee. If he hears thee not, he will not listen. Take with thee two or three, one or two more. Mouth two witnesses or three every word that be established. Those witnesses that are going to go, we're going to show in the next verse, are actually the ones that are exhorting him to repent. They have to know for sure that he committed the act and that the act was sin. They're going to have to know the Bible to know that the action was sinful and truly that he committed it. Because if they don't, they have no business trying to exhort him. Let's see what the next verse says. And if you refuse to hear them, notice it is not hearing you again, the one that's been sent again, but it's hearing those witnesses that you went to get, one or two more. So if you refuse to hear them, tell it under the church. So now here's the here's the situation. The action the action is told to the church. You go to that brother, you show him by the Bible. You know he committed the act, and you have proof of it, and you then show that it's scripture. The scripture, he violated scripture, he sinned, and then you exhort him and try to convince him of it. If he won't be convinced, you take the witness. They are the ones trying to convince him. They have to be convinced that he actually committed the act and that it was a sin. Again, it is not me, if I was the one sinned against, that goes the second time. I'm there. And I serve as one of the witnesses. But he refused to hear it tell it under the church. Then. So now, in this case, the whole church gets involved. In I really believe now, if we read this carefully, every member of the church should go to him. I really believe they should. Now, you have no business going to him unless you're convinced, number one, that he committed the act, and number two, that, he, that the act was sinful. Those two things. He says, and if you refuse to hear the church also, the head of the church, if you refuse to hear the church, let him be under the ears of the Gentile and the public. So now then he is, he is withdrawn from it. But this starts out private. It stays private. If the brother repents, it stops there. There's no evidence that you even tell the church about the sin. John Doe sinned against me. I get him to repent. He, he, he confesses and repents, says, I repent. Now, I don't know if he's repented or not. Luke 17, I, he has told me, I, I repent. If he say, I repent. I'm not in the business of determining whether he really repented. He tells me, I repent. I forgive him. That's Luke 17. But we'll, not, we'll go to that later. But under that condition. So you say, well, he's not going to, he's had born free to repent. Well, that's not my business. My business is I ask him, he says I repent and I forgive him, and then I drop it. Right? And that's Luke 17. We'll not spend time on it. Verily I say unto you, and he says, Whatsoever things ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Now, this passage is lifted out of its context many times. It's dealing with binding things relating to the discipline of the a member who sinned against another person. Now, notice again, it begins with if he sinned against me. I didn't know it, had no sin, I know that he actually did it. And so, what things ever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, what things ever do shall on earth shall be loose in heaven. In other words, if the church scripturally engages in discipline of sin, members who sin, the Lord is with them. What they're doing is agreed upon by the Lord. I believe that's what he's saying there in this case. Now, look carefully. Verse 19, again I say unto if that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, to be done to them of my Father who is in heaven. If the two witnesses, if the two persons agree, and they have been righteous in their actions, they have indeed proven that he, that he sinned, and that the action was sinful that he committed, whatever he said, did, or, done, or thought, I don't know what you think. I can only go by what you say and do. So those two things. And if those are true, then 
these two or three are gathered together in my name, they're gathered together by my authority. They decide this matter. This matter has been decided based upon the principles of the Bible that indeed they have established that he actually was guilty and second, that he actually did something that was sinful or did or said something that was sinful. <clears throat> if we indeed have properly interpreted the scripture, if we indeed, the brother was indeed guilty, we indeed have evidence that he was guilty, then the Lord is with him. He's in the midst of him. Now, as we go further in this, look carefully, the, the two or three members, and this thing won't go backwards on me. The two or three probably link back to the two or three witnesses of verse 16. Convinced it does in this context, this is the immediate context. The decisions made by the church in the name of the Lord, by the authority of the Lord. I have no business, the church has no authority to discipline a member without number one, knowing he in fact committed the act, and number two, knowing that it was sinful, is the, the, what he said or did. And I can't know their thoughts unless they tell me. If someone tells me they had an evil thought, then that's, they told me. And I have their word for it. But we're dealing primarily with what people say and do. Primarily. There's three ways we sin. We sin by thoughts being wrong, our word being wrong, and our actions being wrong. Decisions made by the church in the name of the Lord, by the authority of the Lord, were binding upon the members. The church, if it truly disciplined a member, then that member, the whole church is bound by it. No church is bound to follow. Now, what if the church makes a bad decision and I'm convinced that they have indeed decided something was sinful when it wasn't? I should have stood up when this was brought before the whole church. That's my time at that point to stand up and be counted. This action is not sinful. All right? This brother that uh, was... His car he was parked in front next to the beer joint. Uh, we need to ax, actually check the facts to be sure that he was in there drinking. Right? Maybe he's a policeman and had to go in to, to take break, break up a bar fight. Okay? Does that make sense what we're saying? We got to look at the facts and consider it very carefully. Okay? So we need to look at things carefully. And my situation, but I don't think anybody saw it, but I'm telling you about it. I had to go in with the phone to get someone to come and help me get my car, and it was like 100 degrees outside. I walked a half mile to the bar. I knew where it was because I drove by it every time I went north from, from Mountain View. But the decisions were in the name of or by the authority of the Lord, and the church, if that's true, then the church, the whole church is bound by it. The whole church is obligated to treat him as a Gentile and a public. Now, we have to put together other scripture that tell us other things. And that's, we don't just take that in, in, the, in the face of the rest of the New Testament. The rest of the New Testament will tell me some other aspects of it, which we'll go through as we develop it. The Lord is not a party to an unrighteous decision that might be made by the church. When the church makes an unrighteous decision, deciding that this brother has sinned, or sister has sinned, and they're, they're not, in fact, either not guilty of sin or the action they did was not sinful, then the Lord's not with their decision. He said, I, I'm with you if you do it in my name. But if you don't do it in my name, I'm not with you. God won't be with us. And we need to understand that. Look carefully now. These instructions do not relate to such matters as marking false teachers, Romans 16, 17 through 18, or heretics, Titus 3.10. These actions are public. They're public. And we have to deal with them in a different way. Why? A public sin, I don't have to go to him privately in it if it's public. I don't have to deal with it privately. We'll deal with that later in another lesson or two. A factious man after a first and a second admonition refused. Now, in this context, the first and second admonition, what are you doing in the admonition? I would go back to the principle that we developed in Matthew 18. I am number one showing him that he is indeed guilty of the action. He actually did it or said it. 
And second, that what he said or did is simple. If I don't do that, I don't have any business admonishing you. Again, if we can't establish it. Now, I might not be able to prove something is sinful, and it is sinful. That's just Marion's weakness and lack of study of the Bible. But in that case, I should talk with someone who knows more, study with them more thoroughly, and then work it out. After I have then studied the matter out, then I go to the brother and deal with it. But here a heretic is someone who, a factious man, is someone who splits the church. We must always be righteous in our judgment of others, including false teachers and heretics. And a failure to be righteous is sinful. And I have to deal with them as I would want to be dealt with and as God has told me to deal with them. Again, proving they're guilty of it and secondly, proving that their actions or the words, words or actions were indeed sinful. Now look carefully. Let's go to Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them that are causing the division, occasion of stumbling, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and turn away from them. So here we're marking someone who is causing divisions and occasions of stumbling. Now here's the point. Is it all division wrong? I don't think so. If I have a congregation, if the Barnes Church decides they're going to bring an instrument of music in the, for the worship, I will stand up against it. And if I can't convince you, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm going to leave. I won't worship with you. I won't be part of this congregation any longer. If you decide that uh, we can have divorce for any cause, I will preach against it. And if I can't convince you that there's only one justification for divorce, I'm out of here. I will leave. I will divide with you. I won't be party with you. I won't be part of you. That's, and I can just illustrate with other things. So here, all division is not wrong. The one who introduces the false doctrine or the false practice that splits the church is the one that sins, not the ones who stand for the truth. If I stand for the truth, I'm doing what's right. Of course, I must not be a, a mean-spirited person when I stand for the truth. I must kindly and gently show the brother that he is indeed at fault. Now, here's the point. If John Doe over here is teaching some radical false doctrine, then I go to him and just as kindly as I can to show it. Premillennialism is a false doctrine. Gary had an excellent sermon this morning on that and showed very plainly that it is indeed false. Now, here's the point. If we go to them as kindly as Gary did with us this morning, we're much more likely to convert him than if we go to him in a mean-spirited attitude and upset him and cause him to be resistive to it. So it deals with, and we get back to their principles throughout the New Testament, I go to them as kindly as possible as I can. Let me go back now. I beseech you, brethren, Mark them that are causing the division, occasion of stumbling, contrary to the doctrine which you learn. So they are doing things that cause division and cause stumbling. That cause people to sin. Contrary to the doctrine which you learn and turn away from it. That is, the standard is the Word of God, the doctrine that they learn, which would be the New Testament. Now, then, if we ask this, occasion of stumbling, I illustrated it with instrumental music. If someone introduces and tries to force us and tell us that we can use instrumental music and tries to introduce it into the worship, I can't worship here because it's a stumbling, it's a matter of stumbling. I would be sinning to engage in the use of it. I can't do it. Another thing if, on the divorce for, for any cause, it's only one scriptural ground, that's fornication. If a person introduces that doctrine, Somebody may engage in a divorce for unscriptural reasons and then remarry and sin. And so here's the problem with that. That person was caused to stumble by that false doctrine. In that case, that's pretty serious. I've caused someone to lose their soul. I'm to, we're to turn away from people that do that, contrary to the doctrine. For they that are such serve not our Lord Christ. They're not serving God. 
People who teach false doctrine and cause other people to sin aren't serving the Lord Christ. They're serving their own belly. They have a, 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 a motive that's sinful in some way. And by their smooth and fair speech, they beguile the hearts of the innocent. Some people are very smooth speakers. I know I've heard people that made arguments on various points, and they sounded real good on the surface. But sometimes when you look into them logically, they're just full of, full of holes. The argument is logically unsound. It won't it won't fly. I wish I had time to illustrate it at various points. But people years ago when I was young in college, someone said, Can you answer the arguments on the creation of the earth? And I said, Well no, I can't. But I must be right because you can't answer it. Well, that doesn't prove a thing. If I can't answer it, it only proves I can't answer it. And I studied more thoroughly, and I, I answered the arguments, I believe. But the point is, the fact that you can't answer something doesn't mean that it's wrong or right. All that determines right and wrong is the Scripture, properly interpreted. That's what determines right and wrong. But let's look. A person can be smooth speaker. They can be fair, fair and smooth, smooth and fair speech. We got all the hearts of innocent. Now, look carefully further some more. We are to go to the brother who has sinned against us and try to reconcile the matter. So we go to him, try to reconcile him. All right? And if thy brother sin against thee, go and show him his fault between thee and him alone. If he hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. And we'll come back to the false teacher and the heretic later, another lesson. We're to take the witnesses who will try to determine the guilt or innocence of the accused. They go in with a fresh mind, looking at it in a fresh. Now, here's the problem. I've accused John Doe of sin against me. They really think the world of me. They don't, eh, John Doe, he's just not, not someone they, they know very well or, or they think much of. If they take my word for it without examining the facts, they're unrighteous. Because it is their job to go back to square one, establish one point. Number one, that it indeed happened. And number two, that it is indeed sinful. If they don't establish those two, they're not the proper kind of witnesses to take. I would say if you're going to take witnesses, take mature members of the church with you who know the Bible. Now, don't just take your friend. <laughs> take someone who can be it. Truly a neutral in the matter, and look at the Bible. If you hear thee not, take with thee one or two more, that the mouth of two witnesses or three, every word may be established. Okay? We refuse to hear them, go to the church, refuse to hear the church. See? Each time you get another group of people that are studying the matter out, looking at the facts, determining that action actually occurred, that the words or, or acts actually occurred, and that they are sinful. Then they exhort, they try to show the person being as kind and gentle as they can to that person. And then at that stage, the whole church is to deal with it. The whole passage begins with the prom premise, number one, the premise, the brother sin. If that's a question that's still up in the air, we have to stop at the, we don't even start the whole process. If I can't prove the brother sin, it stops right there. I don't do anything else. I get my Bible and start doing what? Studying the Bible. Or I go to someone who knows the Bible, but you need to be very careful. You need to listen to people. Do they really give sound reasoning to show that the action is sinful, or do, are they just quoting someone? Now, I've seen people that quote some famous preacher. And they'll cite him and say, Brother so-and-so said so-and-so. That is traditionalism. Did Brother So-and-So give an argument to establish his point, his claim? What is his argument? I won't look at his argument. And then I look at it. Yeah, he made a good argument. It's sound reasoning. Yeah, that's true. He's right. But if he doesn't give a sound argument, it's no more than just quoting someone else. I've, I've, I've cited human authority, not the Bible. Now, look. Guilt is determined by a righteous standard. Keep that in mind. 
we take it before the whole church, who must also judge righteously, determine who's guilty. Every member of the church has a duty to study this matter out for themselves and decide. And if they see a flaw in the reasoning of the whole church, one person sees a flaw in the reasoning of the whole church, he has to stand up and speak against it, or he or she needs to speak against it. Because the church needs to be right in their actions. If the whole church makes a decision, and that decision is made, and it's flawed by either the action wasn't proven that it actually occurred, or that the action was sinful, then the church now has committed the sin of being unrighteous. They are guilty now. And so now a brother now has been falsely accused, falsely convicted, and sin has occurred on the part of everybody who's done it. That's pretty serious. That could, that could be the salvation of souls to be in jeopardy. We refuse to hear them. Now, a season of them is the church. Tell it unto the church, that's the witnesses. If he refused to hear the church also, so they, if he refused to hear the church, that would be able to be as Gentile folk at that point. But again, every member of the church is involved. Every member of the church needs to get their Bibles out and start studying. Brethren, we need to study our Bibles every day. We need to open them up and be reading and studying and meditating. Right? If the church determines one is guilty, the person who is innocent will treat the guilty party as the Gentile and the public. Okay? However, the church must exhort the guilty party to repent. Go back to verse 17. Refuse to hear them, tell it the church, or refuse to hear the church also. So the church was exhorting him. They had no business exhorting him if they don't know that the action was sinful and that and that he actually committed it. If he refused to hear the church, that would be under the Gentile public. I hope this is clear to all of us. Only after he refused to hear the church is fellowship to be withdrawn from the person. The whole church needs to be involved. But as we look carefully, all of this judgment is by a righteous standard. Look carefully further now. Verse 18, Verily I say unto you, What things ever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, what things ever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. God said, I'm with you if you truly bound it by my, by my word. You did this by my word. So the discipline of members is God with us. If we know they indeed were guilty of saying or doing something sinful, or if they tell us their thoughts, their thoughts were sinful. And know, secondly, that the action was indeed sinful, not just think it was. There have been those in the church that have thought it was sinful to take the communion from separate cups. Some say you have to use only one cup. Well, I think we can establish that the use of multiple cups is, is not sinful, in which case their action of condemning accusing us of sin is indeed flawed. The same thing would happen with other principles we can lay out. So again, just because the person's been accused and even a whole congregation has withdrawn from them doesn't mean that they're guilty. Right? The binding was with respect to the righteous judgment of the church. Remember that. What about discipline elders if elders sin? Against an elder received not an accusation except at the mouth of two or three witnesses. Okay? Now, actually, the original says stop receiving accusation. Timothy was guilty of this. He was what well, he had said. Because he was receiving an accusation, didn't have two or three witnesses. You come to me and say, John Doe, and I just, I quit using Jerry and John as illustrations. John Doe has sinned. All right? Number one. Where's your evidence he's, he committed the act? And number two, where's the evidence the act was sinful? If it don't, doesn't supply that, it should stop right there. I should say, you have no business bringing this up until you have established those two points. Leave it alone. Study it some more. Note that the elders are afforded the same rights as other members. Two or three witnesses are required to establish a matter. A charge against them. 
There's no double standard with respect to them. They have the same standard applied to them that's applied to other people. You don't let them skate, and you don't uh, you don't apply a stricter standard to them. It's the same standard. Them that sin. Now the word sin here is a continuous action verb in the original. Those that persist in their sin after you have rebuked them. Reprove where? In the sight of all. Now wait a second. If we go back, let's go back now to verse or two. Yes, the elders see not an accusation except at the mouth of two or three witnesses. So after you've had your two or three witnesses, hey, that goes back in principle to the Matthew 18. You have the two or three witnesses. And so those that persist in their sin after you have exhorted them, so those that sin, you reprove. Or to reprove means to show that an action is right or wrong. In this case, you would be showing that an action is wrong. Take it before the whole church, show that the, the elder committed that sin, and that none, not only that he committed it, got the evidence of it, and secondly, that the action is sinful. Doing that, you reprove in the sight of all. This would probably be the whole church. Now then, what's the church going to do? I think in line with Matthew 18, they're all going to exhort him to repent, and they're all going to do it in kindness and love. Isn't that pretty clear? Makes it pretty plain to me. So there's no double standard for the elders and other people. That the rest may, al may also be in fear. Now, the, the word rest is not clear. I don't know whether the word rest means the rest of the elders or the rest of the church. You know what I think? I think it's the whole church, including the elders. I think everybody, if an elder is, is singled out and he's committed sin and you show it, and then you reprove, showing everybody. To reprove is to show, expose something as, as being sinful. Why would they not come to the light in the book of John? Because their works that would be reproved by the light, be shown to be sinful. That's what reproving is. That's That word is defined in the book of John. Those who sin, present tense, indicate the sin, and they persist in it. Now, if the brother sinned, the elder sinned, and he turned around and you reproved, you rebuked him, and he repented, I think at that point, the matter stops. It ends. Are elders capable of sinning? Everybody say yes. They're human. But the problem is, you don't treat them differently. You go to them, you show them their sin. If he says, yeah, I, I did sin, and I repent of that. That's where it stops. You don't take it for the church at that point. It just stops right there. Everything's taken care of. And if they sin, they continue in sin, then they're to be reproved publicly to show their sin. Now, if a preacher gets up and exposes the sins of an elder that won't repent, it's probably a moving sermon, or it can be. By that, I mean he may wind up moving, but he has to have the intestinal fortitude to do it, regardless of the consequences. But that must be done. Why? That elder's soul is at stake. His soul is at stake. So the same principle would apply to other people. The rest either refers to the other elders or the whole church. I think it's the whole church. It, that would include the other elders. So I charge thee in the sight of God and Christ Jesus, the next verse, and the elect angels that have observed these things without prejudice, doing nothing by partiality. Don't you be partial. Don't you fail because you like these elders or you like this particular elder. Don't fail to reprove him. If I really love that other, that elder, I'm going to want him to be right with God. This is about true love. I'm going to show him his fault. I'm going to lay it out. I'm going to do it as kindly and as gently as I can. I'm going to do it as much gentleness and love as I can. And at that point, I've shown him love. I've not been partial to him. There may, there may be three or four elders. One of them may be real likable. And I may just kind of be kind of disposed to let him skate a little bit. No, if I love him, I don't want him to be in a lost state. That's about love. This is about love. 
So I won't be partial. Again, partiality is sin. Note that Paul enjoys the same righteous standard we find in the Old Testament. No prejudice and no partiality. None whatsoever. This has been the case from the Garden of Eden on. Look carefully now. Lay hands hastily on no man. Either be protected by the men's sins, keep thyself pure. Now, here's the problem. What is this referring to? Now, that's that's a hard thing. Is it saying don't ordain men as elders hastily? Well, that may be. It may also mean don't discipline that man. And Timothy had, had by the structure of the Greek, he had actually received the accusation without having the witnesses. Maybe it was one witness. And he was laying hands hastily on him to, to discipline him somehow. He'd be partaken of him and said, Now, let's say this. John Doe is an elder, and I accused him of sin. And I have no evidence except my word. I don't think the matter can go any further. You can talk to him about it. The accusation has been made. And if the brother denies he committed the act or said the thing, I'm, I'm at a stalemate. Because I've got the word of two men and they're contradicting one another. Somebody's lost. Somebody's lost. I don't know who which one. I can't tell which one. Oh, I like this one. He, he must be all right. No, that's not my stand. That's, that's partiality. Okay. So don't be partaking of them in sin. So don't partake in the sins of others. You could partake of their sins by taking the word of one person without evidence or without evidence that it was sinful and taking the matter further and distance. Or he could be a partaker in their sins by not following through and showing that they indeed sin in a kind and gentle way to try to get them to repent. If I don't work on them to try to get them to repent, I have sinned. That's serious. If a brother has sinned and we, don't, we let them skate, we're guilty ourselves because it's a lack of love and Contrary to the Bible. Keep yourself pure. The act of laying on of hands has three possible interpretations. Lay on, lay on hands to ordain. Lay hands to harm, which of course wouldn't be right. Lay hands to discipline. I think this is the meaning here from the context, in my judgment. That's what it's about. There are several ways to be a partaker, have fellowship with the sins of others. Number one, if we fail to reprove them. I saw John Doe sin. I just let it go. I don't care. I don't love him enough to try to get him to do right, to get him right with God. That means I don't love him. I have no fellowship with the fruit of works of darkness, but rather reprove them. There's only two options. If this verse is correct, I either fellowship with the fruit of works of darkness or I show that they're sinful show that they're wrong. I believe Gary this morning showed plainly that premillennialism is a work of darkness. What can I say? He's laid it out for us. We've preached on it here before, other sermons. We don't have fellowship with them because we've preached and taught against them. We've shown by the scriptures that it's sinful. Right? I've reproved them. They have been reproved. If I show indeed even if the brother was only one at one point, there's only one person accusing a person of sin. I will go to them and talk to the two of them and I'll say, brother, somebody's not telling the truth here. Whoever's not telling the truth has sinned because I'll show that lying is sinful. And I'll say, if you falsely accuse your brother, you've sinned. If the brother has sinned and won't repent of it, he has sinned. And I have to leave it that way. And I show indeed that the action is sinful, that he was accused of, but he denies that he committed it. What can I do? I can't do anything. I'm at a stalemate. There's nothing I can do. I'm not going to spread it around either. I'm going to leave it alone. And I'll, if I can talk to the brothers, I'll study with them some more. Open the Bible and we'll study. But I'll try to get them to repent. One of them is sin. Either I've falsely accused John Doe, or he has refused to be exhorted and reproved of his sin. 
go back to the elders with the comfort of the sins of others by encouraging them in their sins. Second John 11, for he that giveth him greeting partaketh in his evil deeds. And that's that, that's showing we partake of their evil deeds uh, by encouraging them. If a person keeps coming to us teaching false doctrine, I have to show him he's guilty of, of teaching error, and I can't keep on receiving it. I have to stand against it. We become partaking the sins of others by being involved in discipline of the elders without following the scriptures. Right? By not having sufficient evidence to convict the elder of sin. Now, the elder may be guilty. I just can't prove it. I can't go any further. I have to stop there. All right? By not having two or three witnesses. Don't have the witnesses. Don't have the evidence. Don't have sufficient evidence. By condemning them without a fair trial. All of this is principles of the Old Testament. It's possible that the truth may not be evident. And in 1 Timothy 5.24, that the church may not be able to determine who is guilty or who is innocent in the matter to be judged. John Doe had an evil thought. I don't even know whether he did or not. Is he guilty? Yes. Can I prove it? No. What can I do? I can preach against having evil thoughts as a preacher. But that's, that's the best I can do. Because I can't prove he did it. We've got to, we've got to, as God's people, we've got to be careful what we do. Some men's sins are evident. They're in the open. They're clear. Going before into judgment. But some men also, they follow after. The sins aren't evident. See, the word but shows they're, they're not in the category of being evident. They're secret. I don't know your secret sins, if you have any. God knows them, and you will have to answer to God. Now, what do I do as a preacher? I preach that even my secret sins must be repented of. And I preach the things that could be secret sins. And that's between you and God. If you've committed a secret sin, take care of it between you and God. You don't have to tell the church. You need to repent of it. Make it right with God. We have this principle in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 1 and 17. He shall not, you shall not respect persons in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. Treat everybody alike, equal. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You don't play favorites. You shall not be afraid of the face of a man, for the judgment is God. God says, I'm with you. That's back to Matthew 18. And the cause that is too hard for you, you shall bring it to me, and I will hear it. You have to wait on God. We don't have miraculous guidance today like they did to determine the guilt or innocence of the person. All I can do is, can't prove one way or the other, I'm going to preach on it. I'll preach that the action is sinful. I'll show by Scripture, trying to convert that brother. Hopefully he'll listen. I won't be mean-spirited. I won't point him out when I get up and preach because he may not even be guilty of doing it. I better be careful when I preach it that I'm sure that it's a sin that I've interpreted the Bible correctly, too. If there arise a matter too hard for the in judgment, between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, between matters of controversy within thy gates, then shalt thou arise and get thee up in the place where Jehovah God will choose. Go to the Lord and ask for guidance. They had miraculous guidance, which we don't have. Thou shalt come unto the priests, the Levites, and the judge that shall be in those days, and thou shalt inquire, and they shall show thee the sentence of judgment. Again, we have the scriptures laid out for us. We don't have that miraculous guidance anymore. Since we don't have miraculous guidance, we must wait for the judgment day later, either in this life or the day of judgment. Hopefully, if I preach on the matter, showing that it's indeed sinful, the brother will repent if he's guilty. Right. In the, is the church qualified to settle every matter that might come up before the brethren? That's the question. The answer is no. The smaller matters were brought to the church, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2, but other matters were not brought to the church. Dare any of you having a matter against his neighbor go to law before the unrighteous, not before the saints? Or know you not that the saints shall judge the world? 
And if the world is judged by you, you're, are you unworthy to judge the smaller matter? This matter here, as we look at it carefully, deals with sin on the part of the brother, and it's taking the brother to court. The church may not grant a divorce. Why? Because that's the domain of the civil government. Okay? So the church can't do that. We're to render unto Caesar what Caesar's. Then of them, then render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, of God the things that are God. Under the law of Moses, it was both a civil law and a, and a, and a religious law, a law. We don't have a civil law. We have United States civil law here. Each government has its own law. The church does not have the authority to probate a will. Okay? Doesn't have that authority. The church doesn't have the authority to punish a criminal. Perhaps one member of the church murders another member. We can, we can withdraw fellowship if they if there's proof he murdered him, but that's all we can do. We can't put him to death, but the civil government can. See, it's it's different between the law of Moses and now. Church may withdraw fellowship, but the family of the murdered person may go to the civil government for justice without violating First Corinthians six one and two. Follow. My my wife gets murdered. My or my son gets murdered. My daughter gets murdered. Or my grandchildren gets murdered. I can go and ask the civil government to punish those people that murdered. Not wrong to ask them. God decreed that a murderer shall be punished for the crime. We shall shed of man's blood, by man shall blood be shed, for the image of God made he man. So murder is punishable by death. If what if a Christian goes to the church and gets an unrighteous judgment? In this event, we have to live with the judgment they made. I believe that's the case here. And I just live with it. Let God handle it in the day of judgment. I say this to move you to shame. What cannot be found among you? One wise man who shall be able to decide between the brethren. I will go through at a later time, 1 Corinthians 6. This is a, a troublesome passage that needs to be dealt with in more detail. So we'll deal with it later. But brother goeth the law of brother, that for unbelievers, nay, or it is altogether defect in you that you have lawsuits one with another. Why not rather take wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? We have to put this in its context that I won't deal with that here at this time. That is a passage that needs to be dealt with more thoroughly. The Lord's church is to follow the same righteous standard the law of Moses set forth. <clears throat> we must have two or three witnesses to convict. Must have sufficient evidence to convict. Now, the evidence that we have to have is that they indeed did, did the action or said the thing, said or did something sinful. And number two, that it is indeed sinful. That would be a proper interpretation of the Bible. We must diligently and logically examine the evidence. The church cannot settle all matters between brethren. We can't probate a will or grant a divorce. Some matters are left to the civil government to settle. We have to deal with let the civil government handle. So again, this starts us with I have another eight lessons to deal with here. So we'll deal with it in the next two months or so. I hope this has been fruitful to us and that we've dealt with Matthew 18 primarily tonight. If you're here and subject to the gospel, we're going to sing an invitation song in a minute. Those who are not members of the church, and I only see one who's not, uh, need to, those who are not members need to hear, believe, repent, confess, if they're the age of accountability. Those who are members of the church, if you've committed public sin, you need to confess it publicly because the church should know about it. If they know about it, they should have been coming to you already to get you to repent. But if they haven't done that, you still need to repent. If you've committed private sin, Take it between you and God. Tell him you repent and truly repent. And he'll forgive you if you ask him to. Matt, uh, Luke 7. You're subject. We're going to sing an invitation song this time. You're subject. We're not telling us we're subject.